How's it going, everybody? Facebook Live, 4 o'clock, Barbecue with Drew. Uh, first time I'm allowed to take over the House of Barbecue Experts Facebook, and I'm going live to talk about my 10.5 brisket commandments. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, pointers. If you guys like and share this post, we're giving, giving something away. I'll tell, give you a little bit of detail on that later. If you have any questions, fire away. <laughs> Ricky, bring it, baby. I like it. Thanks for tuning in. So thanks again for joining me, Facebook Live, 10.5 Commandments of Brisket. Uh, I'm going to get right into it, but before I start, I just want to give a shout out to uh, the Finch Market, Chef Luke at the Finch Market. I uh, got this nice, beautiful Northern Gold Premium Canadian Beef Brisket, it's about 16 pounds. So we're going to tackle this today. I'm going to do a third of the course today, I call it a course, a third of the live today, a third of the live tomorrow, and a third of the live on Thursday, I'm going to just quickly go over the things we're going to cover. Uh, first commandment, make a plan, stick to the plan. Um, that, it's actually, that's probably the most nerdy part of the, of the, of the live, but it's, it's, if you make a plan and you stick to the plan, uh, that's how you can learn to adjust and make things better for the next time. So we're going to go over that quickly. Uh, then we're going to talk about the tools of the trade, how to be prepared how to select your brisket. Uh, we're gonna talk about the difference between the point, and the, fa the point and the flat of the brisket. We're gonna trim and talk about what we're gonna do with the trimmings and we're gonna inject today. Tomorrow we're gonna cover uh, talking about brisket on sale. Eight, uh, the eighth commandment is gonna be um, optional techniques, whether or not to use water pans, talking about the Texas crutch, which is wrapping your brisket. And we're talking about uh, what to do with au jus and the drippings. Um, and then uh, the Tenth Commandment, cutting against the grain. Uh, on Thursday, once this baby's done, we're going to slice it up for you and show you how we work our way through the prep brisket. And then Commandment 10.5. Um, you know, so many people talk about cooking based on temperature, which is absolutely correct. Um, but I will say that over time, you will learn that temperature is a great guideline, but texture and feel definitely trumps um, the temp in that all briskets are you know built a little bit differently and sometimes a brisket's ready at 198 and sometimes a brisket's ready at 208 uh 208 degrees internal so um let's get uh, let's dive right in with the first commandment is making a plan and sticking to the plan i'm going to put this baby aside for just a second i apologize take one one more good look at it and then we're going to tear it open so make a plan and stick to the plan so many people ask me, how long do you cook? How long do you rest? How, what temperature do you cook at? And you can read 60 cookbooks. You can watch 100 of these Facebook Lives. The reality is there is no exact science. So I'm going to flip the question back to all of you and ask, when do you say au jus again? Au jus. Au jus. When do you want the brisket ready? And that's really the end all be all in helping make your plan. Uh, and, and literally nerd out and, and write it down. So um, if I want my brisket to be ready tomorrow at dinner time, let's call dinner time 5 p.m. I'm going to make that my target temp, 5 p.m. Simple, write her down. And I'm going to work backwards from there. Let's use this as a, a, a guideline. My rule of thumb is, with it from 15 to 17 pounds. Can this even be a test? <laughs> That's not funny, Caroline, but I appreciate you tuning in. Um, so 5 p.m. Uh, is, is when I'm gonna hope to have this ready for. I'm gonna work backwards from there. I know right away that I want two to three hour rest. Three is ideal, but it also gives me a window for cushion. So if I want a three hour rest, three hour rest, I'm gonna start at 2 p.m. 
sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to aim to finish at 2 PM. So my target temp, if I say it's 198 or 205 or whatever I decide I want it to be, I want it ready for 2 PM so that I can serve at five o'clock with that three hour, three hour rest. You have no idea how many times I get a text message or a call. Hey, my brisket's at the stall. It's not pushing through. It's not going to be ready. If you're, if you're aiming for 5 PM, you know, now, and then maybe potentially resting it, you're actually pushing it out to 8 PM, um, you know, with that three hour difference. So aim to be early aim to be ready done early. Longer rest is okay. Uh, you know, and the, this marginal rest is, is, is circumstantial. If you end up with a two hour rest, it's not the end of the world. If you end up with a one hour rest, it's not the end of the world. But if you can aim for a three hour rest, that's ideal. And then from 2 p.m., I want a 12 hour cooking window. So 12 hours you know, prior to that obviously is 2 a.m. Which means I need to start my brisket at 2 a.m. And when I say start the brisket, that means the cooking process needs to begin at 2 a.m. So I'm throwing the brisket on, the grill is preheated and I'm ready to roll at two in the morning. Again, this is based on a, a guideline of 12 hours. I'm not saying you can't put it on at 9 p.m. and get some sleep. I'm not saying you can't put it on at 6 a.m. and rush the cook. I'm just giving you a basis based on a 12 hour cook and the concept of being ready on time, making the plan and sticking to the plan. So if I'm ready at 2 a.m. to throw my brisket on, I've preheated my grill, I've rubbed my brisket, I've injected my brisket, I've rested it in the fridge if I wanted it to. Uh, you know, some people say bring it to room temperature, some say people, some people say put it on cold. Circumstantial, you can do it either way. The reality is, this is my guideline temperature plan to get me where I need to be for serving time tomorrow at 5 p.m. Some of the things that we can talk about in this window, in the, between 2 a.m. and 2 p.m., is uh, wrapping, uh, which is also known as the Texas crutch, and we'll cover that a little bit more tomorrow. But uh, basically the concept there is we take a brisket from um, at, at 2 a.m. when we're putting it on, we're gonna low and slow the brisket until it achieves a specific temperature inside. More importantly than the temperature inside is the texture of the bark um, and the process of the rendering of the fats. So what happens when we cook our brisket is the muscle eventually will start to tense up and sweat. As we heat up the muscle, um, just, just like compared to a human muscle when we go to the gym, I don't go to the gym, but some people do, and when you go to the gym, you work out and all of a sudden you start to sweat, the re what's happening is the body is trying to cool down those muscles. Same exact concept with a brisket, we throw it on the grill, it's gonna get to 150, 160 degrees, and it's gonna stall out, it's gonna start to sweat and it's gonna stay there. Um, so some people use the, this Texas crutch wrapping, whether it be with tin foil or butcher paper to help, to help get it through that rest. I'm uh, sorry, through that stall. And I want to kind of time this to when I'm going to be awake. So I don't feel like waking up at three in the morning, four in the morning, five in the morning, six in the morning. So I'm going to play this game based on my schedule to have it ready for 5 PM. And I'm going to say that I want to gauge my wrap between 6 AM and 7 p.m., or 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. What happens here is, uh, if I get up at 6 a.m. and the and the and the, the bark is where I want it to be, I can wrap right away. If the bark is not where I want it to be, I don't have to wrap right away. And so from two from 2 a.m. until 2 p.m. working backwards, and sorry, from 2 a.m. until 6 a.m. working backwards, we're going to leave it on at 225 degrees. Um, and then we're going to wrap at this point and we're going to hope that my, my brisket temperature is in between 160 degrees and 170 degrees. Now from experience, the reason why I'm giving you those two temperatures as guidelines is typically that's when the brisket starts to sweat. If you hit it before the sweat, the bark and the crust and the rubs that we're putting on the brisket aren't really gonna have a, time, a full opportunity to really set to the brisket. It is my belief that you wrap once there is a little bit of sweat coat. <laughs> That's funny. Um, once there's a little bit of coating of sweat that helps blend that, that, that rub, the salts, the peppers, the flavors to the crust, to the bark, and then we wrap. Uh, so if I'm aiming to wrap around 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 
I can do a simple swipe test. I go out, I open my cooker and I literally smear with my finger. If the rub is coming off of the cooker, uh, off of the brisket, it's not quite ready yet. Uh, but I can, I can assure you that this timeline based on 15 to 17 pounds, if you're throwing it on at two in the morning by 6 AM, you've got, you've got uh, a close to ready to wrap brisket. Um, and you, again, these aren't in stone numbers. If you decide you want to cook it at 180 degrees all night long, uh, from 2 AM till six in the morning, have at her. And then in the morning we can adjust this timeline, knowing that we need to be done by 2 PM. So after it's wrapped 6 AM to seven, uh, 6 AM to 7 AM, we're na now we have from seven to 2 PM to get it to the finishing temperature and more importantly, the finishing texture. I'm going to gauge that I want, so I've got a leave-in uh, thermometer and I want to be alerted at 195 degrees. So by 2 p.m., I need it to be close to 195 degrees. And when I say 195 degrees, a lot of people say it's not ready at that point. A lot of people will say that it is. Um, it really depends on texture and your preference. What I like to do, starting at 195, that's kind of like the, the, the last lap. And when I get to 195, now it's a texture game and I'm literally probing with a meat thermometer, right? We got the meat thermometer options, the Thermapen, the Thermamax, the thermo, uh, thermo, uh, Thermometer Junior, the Thermamax Junior, all these options will get us, get us a clear idea of where we're at uh, in terms of texture. And I literally want it, the, the texture of the brisket when, once it's finished to be simulated like a, a tub of peanut butter. And I'm not kidding. I've actually tried this method and sat beside a brisket probing just to understand the texture. If you want it to be like butter and further done, that's on you and that's okay. If you want it to be a little bit tougher and hold your slices a little bit better, that's all right too. Uh, just to answer a quick question, do I see a bottle opener on the side? You do, Grant. So this is a beautiful uh, Barbecue Experts apron, comes with a bottle opener and it's actually got a pouch here for your tall boy. I'm not, I'm drinking soda water right now, but uh, it definitely fits the beer in there. Don't forget, if you guys like and share this post, we're giving away one of these to one of you viewers. It's a House of Barbecue Experts, uh, House of Barbecue Experts Texas Style Rub, and we're going to be using this on the brisket today. Uh, so like and share, please. Thanks again for tuning in. So... Working backwards from 6 a.m. to 7, uh, 7 a.m., we're, we're on our way to 2 p.m. 195 degrees is the target, is the, the, the last lap. And once we get to 195 degrees, we start probing for tenderness. When it's where it's, we, where it's, where, blah. When the brisket is where we want it to be in terms of texture, now we can pull it off and rest. And now we've got that three hour window. So that's kind of my guideline. Uh, I, can, I can add this to the notes later. Super simple. Screenshot it if you want. Uh, this, this is my plan. If you're more detailed than that, you can make a more detailed plan. Commandment number one, make a plan, stick to the plan. 12 hour cook, three hour rest. I know when I'm starting. I know when I'm stopping. Uh, 195 is my finish line as a guide. Uh, sorry, my last lap guide. And then from there I'm, I'm gauging temperature and texture, uh, both together. All right. Uh, second, second commandment be prepared so now that we've got our plan we know what we need but more importantly get all your tools in front of you and ready uh so you're not kind of scrambling especially wintertime cooking you don't want to be outside in your boxers and boots flipping things on the grill and injecting and all that kind of stuff so uh some key some key tools that i use to help me go get going is uh, some table pans i like to have these handy available at the dollar store available through house of barbecue experts available at food, food supply jams, uh, and I really like this size of pan for two reasons. One, it fits in a 24 inch grill, and it fits basically most size briskets. Sharp knife. Barbecue experts, they've got this new series, uh, this new, uh, sorry, the series of knife, Kai Pro. Unbelievable, incredibly sharp, reasonably affordable, and you're not gonna break the bank with these knives. Uh, rubs and injections. Uh, have all your tools and toys ne necessary. Um, so we've got some Cosmos Q, which I use with mine, and I also use Butcher Barbecue. Uh, I believe this is a little hidden tip for me. Both call for a third a cup in their injection. Uncle Drewski goes half and half, so I'm doing a scoop and a half of each into two cups of water. 
and then get it into a gravy separator or a mixer or a protein shaker and shake it up with two cups of cold water. Got to be cold. You can't be injecting your brisket with, with warm water. Gloves are handy to have. They're not necessary, but they're a good uh, cleanliness tool to have. Uh, injector. There's a couple of different types you can use um, from a base model, which would be a plastic injector like this guy. I don't know how well you can see that, the injector. Um, or you can go a little bit further and upgrade and go to a stainless steel option, or you can take it to the next level. This is my favorite on the market. It's by Butcher Barbecue. It's, it is available by House of Barbecue Experts. Experts. Um, it's called the Pistol Grip Injector. Uh, it's just a quick inject, and you can preset your amounts of injection that are going into the brisket, and then you just pull the trigger, and it's automatically going to put it in. So you'll see this, this guy in action at the end of today's live. Um, obviously, you're going to need your either your butcher paper or your aluminum foil to use as your Texas crutch or your wrap. Have that ready. Uh, you know, Don't be running to the store at 6 in the morning because you forgot your aluminum foil and you're not sure what it's going to... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Have your stuff ready. Looks like I'm placing an order. I like it, Mr. Andre. Uh, and actually, I'm going to give you a shout out, David. Huge thanks. Uh, David was the first local guy uh, of, one, of my referrals to uh, hop on board with the, uh, the Woodwind 24-inch pellet grill. Super stoked to see you have that. Uh, you've actually got yours before mine, so I'm uh, excited for you, and I'm excited to get mine and start cooking on it. I'm excited to try all these new toys that uh, I'm able to get my hands on. And uh, so, so that's exciting. David, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like and share, and uh, we're going to be sending one of you viewers a bottle of uh, the Texas-style rub. Uh, other things to have on hand, thermometer, uh, pick your type of cooker. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say to do it in the oven, but it's possible in the oven. You don't necessarily need the high fancy deal, uh, but we certainly believe in the wood-fired flavor. Uh, so, um, you know, if you're using an offset uh, smoker or a stick burner or a reverse flow or a pellet grill or a Weber Smoky Mountain or uh, the Weber kettle with the all-in-one, there are so many options, uh, so many options in order to get you to this end game at, you know, 5 p.m. brisket ready and servable and have your guests just loving it. All right, I, that's pretty, pretty well it. The only other main component uh, to be prepared with, and this is something that everybody forgets even when they're cooking burgers, have enough fuel on hand. If you're cooking with sticks, make sure you got enough sticks ready. They're cut and they're ready to go. It's a 12-hour cook. you got to be tending that fire. If you're cooking with, with pellets, have your pellets, your bag, you know, have a spare bag ready and the hopper full. Uh, you know, a full bag and a full hopper shouldn't take you more than, than 12 hours, uh, but have it just in case. Uh, and who's to say you're not going to throw something else on after or before. So have enough fuel on hand. All right, now let's get to the nitty gritty. Enough with the nerdy stuff. So as mentioned, Chef Luke, this is a nice northern gold Canadian, uh, Canadian beef. It's uh, some premium stuff. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about this before I cut it open. Uh, basically, commandment number three is select your brisket properly. You can come cook on mine. I appreciate that, David. I may take you up on that at some point. When COVID has subsided, I would love to hang out and uh, talk barbecue and check out the grill and all that stuff. So let's, let's move along quickly here. Uh, selecting your brisket. A couple of key components you wanna take into consideration is A, obviously size for the duration of your cook, uh, but more importantly, the marbling and the fat. So when, I, when people talk about fat, fat is flavor, we don't necessarily mean these hunks of fat on here. And I'm, the reason I'm keeping this in the package, I'll show you again the marbling. Um, the reason I'm keeping it in the package is this is what it's like when we get to the store and this is what I want to see. I want to make sure that the brisket I'm selecting is pliable. It's got some give to it. If it's tough, that means the muscle was stressed, the animal was stressed, and odds are through the cook, it's going to be tough, it's going to be stressed. So we, when we're searching for the brisket, we want to take and, and, and fold and move this thing around and make sure that it's got some pliability to it. And that's going to give us a first good starting point to know that we're going to be uh, working with a piece of meat that's been well treated, well fed, and hopefully get us a good yield and y y uh, a great end product. That wasn't a glitch, that was a stutter. Um, and we need to understand the cut. So brisket is two different muscles um, 
basically molded together through a seam of fat. So from this angle, you've got your flat on top and your point is underneath this decal right here. If I'm cooking and I want a lot of slices or a competition, for example, and I need to take slices out of the main, main part, I need to make sure that my flat is thick, it's got some girth, right? It, it, it's substantial. I don't, I don't wanna be dealing with something that's flimsy that I'm gonna have to cut off and throw away. So marbling, pliability, and marbling, pliability, and understanding the size, the point versus the flat, and make sure you got a nice thick flat. Commandment number four, understanding the point versus the flat. So we need to understand, we're gonna, we're gonna tear this baby open. Give me a second. Any questions, fire away. Again, don't forget to like and share. If you guys have any questions, I'm trying to stay on point here. Just gonna pat this brisket down real quick. Bam. Look at this bad boy. Whew. Look at her. So, we wanna understand the difference between the point and the flat. The flat is what you're seeing here on the top and it's basically um, the, the leaner portion of the meat. So again, you have two muscles. This is how the brisket is built. And on the top portion, leaning out this way, um, you've got a very lean cut and, the, and you, can, you can literally see the grain washing away. And then underneath, you've got the deckel or the point meat, which is the more marbled and fatty and more flavorful, flavorful portion of the brisket. So in understanding that, we understand that we're, we're using this guideline that we talked about earlier, and we're going to cook two completely different muscles one way and expect to yield a great result out of both muscles. It actually doesn't make sense. So two things. One, we can discuss the possibility of separating the two, which some people do and it's a great option, uh, or cooking it whole. For this, for this exercise, we're going to cook it whole. Um, that being said, separating it, in order to do that, you would basically follow this fat seam uh, right here and, and obviously you can cut away some of this big stuff here to get a better view of it, but basically you would follow this fat seam and cut along and around in both sides and in order to expose um, basically the flesh on both sides and slowly pry it away from, its, from each other. And, and, and then you've got two separate muscles and you can attack them differently. You can probe them and monitor them separately. You can cook them at different temperatures if you wish, uh, but we're gonna go old school and, and cook this thing whole. So I hope that helps you select and understand your brisket, which are the th third and fourth commandments. All right, now we're gonna start trimming. I'm probably not gonna talk a whole lot during this. If you guys have questions, fire away. The, uh, the, um, the Facebook Live is also being monitored. So if there are questions that come about, uh, we'll be able to answer you in writing as well. Um, so uh, as we mentioned earlier, good tools. We want a sharp knife and I wanna be cutting away from myself. I don't want to be cutting toward, <coughs> excuse me, and risking burning myself. So we're going to start trimming this bad boy. Um, the, the number five, the fifth commandment, in my opinion, is use your trimmings wisely. Um, I've seen, I've been to a brisket class where they literally trim away almost everything and keep an eight by eight inch square of brisket from the flat in order to use for competition. In competition, that makes complete sense. Smoker boy's in the house. What's up, Rick? How are you, brother? Thanks for tuning in. So an eight by eight, or some people would literally throw it on like this, and that's okay too. What I'm gonna tell you is that my way is a little bit different uh, than both. I am certainly aggressive with the trimming, but the reason is because I keep the trimmings for 
Uh, I throw them through a meat grinder and make my own burgers, make my own sausage, make my own ground beef. Uh, so uh, as we're trimming away, we can kind of discard the stuff that we know we don't want to use for burgers and, and, and ground meat. And we want to keep some of the fat um, in order to you know, add some flavor and some, some texture to the ground beef that we're keeping. So I'm going to hang on to that for now and we're going to sort that out later. Uh, my ideal trim shape is to get the brisket looking as aerodynamic as possible, kind of like a race car. So anything I'm not going to put back in my mouth, I'm going to throw down in the garbage. Try to keep your blade away from you as much as possible. Super sharp knife helps here. So this is the flat side. And the reason we're trimming right here is to basically get the meat exposed to the rub and the flavors that we're gonna add shortly. Um, one of the, a little quick kind of shortcut technique. If you have, so right here, we've got a little bit of fat entering into kind of a valley. And if I run my knife flush, it's very difficult to get at. If you bring your hand underneath, it gives it kind of this mound and then I can work at this, this fat that's, that's kind of hidden in that valley. And when I said aerodynamic earlier, that's exactly what I mean is I don't want very many valleys. I want it to be as aerodynamic as possible to try and get an even coat of smoke and an even coat of temperature over the entire brisket. So here's actually, this is fun. This is not something you'd like to see in the brisket, but in this scenario, I don't know if you guys can see that. So in the butchering process, there's a little bit of a side cut here. So I know that this little flap here is gonna kinda overcook and not be edible. So I'm gonna trim aggressively and get rid of that and use it with my ground, ground meat. And now we don't have that valley there. So that's good stuff. Don't forget to like and share guys. We're giving away a bottle of Texas Bar House of Barbecue Experts Texas style rub. It's all good stuff. So that's just to kind of give you an idea on the top side of what we're looking for. And you can get about as picky as you want and how much you take off. <clears throat> I, have, I have a tendency to get rid of the this exterior Sometimes they'll almost look, appear gray on the side. So I'm gonna literally take my knife and chop this right off. And once I do this, this exposes the difference between our point and our flat. So you can see the point meat with all the marbling and I can see the flat meat above it and over and the, sorry, the flat meat runs above and over and the point meat is underneath. And this is where the seam is. So on this side and up is going to be much more lean and on this side under the decal and down is going to be much more fatty, far more flavorful and that's where our burnt ends come from. So if you guys have any questions about the trim while I hack away at this thing, feel free and I'll try and catch them. And I'm gonna try and give you guys as many visuals as possible. So again, we've got another flap here. This is something that's not gonna cook evenly and we're just gonna get rid of it. And some people would say, oh my God, you're getting rid of so much of the brisket. I don't disagree, but I'm not wasting this. So again, this, this trimming style is partial, is particular to the way I cook it because I'm not throwing this delicious, delicious Northern Gold brisket away. I'm gonna use that. And if you guys get in the habit of keeping these trimmings and making your own ground beef, for, for you know, any application, whether it be chilies and spaghetti sauces, to briskets, uh, sorry, to burgers, to uh, shepherd's pies and all these kinds of things. This, this quality of meat is, is so much more rich than what you're gonna buy in the ground beef section at the supermarket. Okay, as we're cooking, we're getting rid of the gray stuff on the exterior. Again, this is all stuff that can be thrown in our, with our ground beef. Try to keep the hands out of the way if you're cutting towards yourself. And 
again, so because the, the flat is very lean, this, this portion of the brisket is going to be far less forgiving. And therefore, I would rather save some of these ends of my brisket and cook them into a sauce or into a burger um, and add some of the fat that I've taken off. So I'm actually going to shape this up like a race car. Boom. So that's gone, but that's going into a grinder. So don't get rid of it. Trimming against the grain, not necessary. Again, if you're having a hard time getting under it, use that trick underneath the brisket. Throw some fingers up in there. And then at the end, late, later on in the cook, I want to be slicing against the grain. And that's our 10th commandment or our 10th and a half, 10.5. That to be said, in order for, especially if you haven't done brisket a whole lot, slicing against the grain is pretty important. So in the trimming process, I want to be notching my brisket, um, especially if this is the first brisket I've ever done or maybe even the 10th brisket I've ever done. But having this small notch is gonna give me a great guideline as to where my slices are gonna start. So when it's cooked and you got a nice black dark bark on this here, you're not guessing and potentially slicing with the, with the grain. You know that I've notched out here and that's where my slices are gonna come from. Again, all this is not waste. This is, this is just repeating myself over and over and over again for your pleasure. So it's looking pretty reasonable up top. Um, if this was competition style stuff, I would definitely be finicky with how much I'm taking off or leaving on on the top side. But that's looking reasonable. And again, right here, if I take, if I dig in here, I'm exposing a valley which won't cook evenly. And so I, it's, I'm making the choice to leave that fat in there so that, you know, this Basically, this part of the brisket is going to be thicker than this. And so we want to leave that as thick and as even as possible so that we get an even cook right across the flat. The point, on the other hand, is far more forgiving. And it's not something we need to be as concerned about. So that, I, I hope you guys are starting to see this kind of race car shape happening. Better than mine to get a brisket at Costco. Finally got in and they had none. We'll try tomorrow. Uh, who's that? Kent Coleman. Kent, uh, I've actually called a couple of times this weekend. Uh, super jealous because in the province of Quebec last week or the week before, they had a crazy deal on brisket. Uh, I think it was $2.99 a pound and dudes on, on these blogs and forums were posting that they were buying them by the tens, uh, which is actually one of the commandments that we're going to talk about tomorrow but I'll just brief on it right now since I have time, is uh, as much as I want to support the local butcher, as much as I want to support the local butcher or, you know, guys like uh, Chef Luke at the Finch Market or, um, you know, the reality is we all have potentially kids to feed or a budget that, that's in line and therefore buying on sale is so key. <coughs> Excuse me. And more importantly, Especially when learning the brisket, um, I would it would you know absolutely destroy my heart to see somebody invest you know two hundred dollars or more on these high end uh, super crazy high end briskets and they don't know how to cook them. The reality is, if you can buy a brisket on sale at two ninety nine a pound and learn to cook that baby and be satisfied with the with the outcome imagine what you can do once you start moving your way up the echelon of price point. So start with the brisket that's on sale, buy brisket on sale. Don't be afraid to trim some off and get it into some ground meat, invest in a, in a grinder and uh, yeah, buy on sale. That being said, the quality stuff certainly speaks for itself once it comes off the cooker. I see a question there from Rick Dore asking, do I trim out the decal? Uh, I do not, but I have, and I'm not saying it's right. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I like that. Luke uh, mentioned, you just ma made a comment that he can't blame 
especially when learning, right? Uh, once you've learned and you want the higher quality stuff, go see guys like Chef Look or L'Entrepôt de Viand or uh, Saslov's in Ottawa. These guys are, are phenomenal. Uh, you know, they're very involved in the barbecue community and these are the guys that we want to be supporting for sure and they've got the top-notch quality stuff, so so excellent. So back to my, uh, back to Rick's question, do I trim out the decal? I do not, I have. So basically what Rick's asking is this portion here, the decal, the, 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 the fat that separates the point from the flat. Some people will trim this out and really expose and get more rub uh, underneath the flat and onto the point. And I'll answer you as to why. When I'm cooking at home, this is the, the race car shape is the, is the mode I'm going for and I don't want an uneven cook. The concept of, of cutting out the decal is really to expose more bark on both sides of the muscles. So on the underside of the flat and on the overside of the point. Great technique. However, if the goal is to expose it, why just separate some of it? Why not, like we discussed earlier, separate the entire the entire two muscles and at which point we could cut the decal right out from underneath the, the flat side and cut it right off the top of the point and by doing that especially for the flat side then we have a lot more control on the muscle itself and we have control as to how much fat we're going to leave on the flat in order to support the cook process and get us where we need to be so we're almost done for today, believe it or not. We've just got to finish up this trim and then we're going to inject. So we've done this one side. Looks kind of race car. Do, do, I have a, do I have somebody in agreement that it looks like a race car? Maybe whoever likes that comment or who, somebody says, yes, it looks like a race car. Maybe you'll win a bottle of Texas, uh, Texas style rub from House of Barbecue Experts. Yes, it looks like a race car. Does that look like a race car? Kind of looks like a race car. A big sexy race car. All right, we're gonna turn this baby over. On this side, you guessed it, this entire piece of the decal, she gone. And you can see that I've exposed the beautiful marbling. Yes, it looks like a race car. Rick Dore could be the guy, could be the guy. Daphne, I hope you see that. Rick Dore, yes, it looks like a race car. Now, were you just saying that, though, is the question. Were you, were you just saying that, or does it actually look like a race car? And I know, Rick, you're a, you're a big racing guy, so tell me which kind of car it looks like. Formula One, I love it. Keep it coming, keep it coming. All right, so on, now we've exposed the other side here, and we're seeing the difference between the flat meat on the underside, right? We flipped our brisket over, and the point meat on side, on the top side now, which has a ton of marbling. This part here is super forgiving. So we want to expose some of the point meat, but we don't want to gouge into the flat. So I just took that big chunk out and I'm kind of working at the deco like Rick suggested earlier. This is all good stuff that I can add to my burgers later. So as I'm getting down here, I can see that I'm getting close. See the little pink exposed right here? I'm getting close to the flat meat and that's where I want to start etching away from that meat and I want to leave that on. And again, we want it aerodynamic. So I, I kind of see where that's happening actually. And believe it or not, there's just a little spud kind of sticking out. So I'm going to kind of make a flat cut straight down and I know that that's where I need to stop. Aerodynamic, massage the meat, love the meat. And then all we've got left to do is the top side, which can be rather finicky. Um, and basically the more of this we take off, the more rub can be exposed. Rick Dory has a nice spoiler. That is a nice spoiler. Maybe Dan and Patrick race car. I like it. Thanks Michael for tuning in, I appreciate it. Yes, it looks like a race car. Burgers, baby. All right. Um, so the final step in the trimming process here, uh, I want to leave about a quarter inch of fat on top on the top side, and that quarter inch of fat is more important on the flat portion than it is on the point. And the reason is because we don't necessarily need to leave a lot of fat on the point part, part uh, because of how marbled it is. 
it's it's well protected. It's very forgiving or more forgiving than the than the flat. So this here this here is all gonna be trimmed off and thrown into some burgers. And as we work our way around the race car shape, aerodynamic, we can kind of expose just a little bit and see what we're working with on the other side. We know how thick the flat is. So Rick is saying that he levels out all his briskets to avoid pooling and you get pooling. If you get pooling, you don't build bark. So that's a great point, Rick. And that's exactly what I was talking about on this side. If I was to etch out this fat, I would leave a valley and the valley would collect moisture and then the moisture would prevent bark. And we all know that bark is flavor. That's a great knife. Chris James, yes, it is a great knife. Kai Pro, uh, Kai Pro is available at House of Barbecue Experts, or sorry, maybe Barbecue Quebec. Um, and I'll be honest with you, the key to a great knife is a sharp knife. Um, I've got a honing steel that I just ran it through right before, right before tackling this brisket. So I'm just turning this over to my side here for a second, just to get a good visual on how much fat I need to take off. And we're trying to leave a quarter inch between the flat or sorry, on top of the flat, we're trying to leave about a quarter inch of fat. So here we got too much. We can take that off. Bam. And as we move toward the flat, on the back side here, as we move toward the flat, we're gonna get less and less fat. So if you look on this side, we've got our quarter inch already. Hope you guys can see that pretty well. So that I don't wanna touch this side. I wanna basically get the thick fat decal on this side to level out and even out so that it kind of matches and blends into the race car aerodynamic concept from before. Bam. So now we're seeing the quarter inch of fat is what's left. How's she looking? How's she looking? So uh, if if uh, if we decide if we decided to give it away to the first person that said this looks like a race car, uh, you'll be contacted in your direct messages, and you have to accept the prize before we send it out. Confirm your shipping address and all that stuff. So, aerodynamic. Um, a little bit of a notch here. We could kind of level that out a bit so that there's less of a valley. Is one option. The second option is to get rid of her. And some will say, oh my God, look what just happened. This is burgers. I mentioned at the start that I get rid of stuff aggressively. So don't uh, crucify me for making this thing look like a race car. Boom. This is looking exactly the way I want it. Just getting kind of level this off just a hint more. That's looking pretty good. Bam. Yeah, that's lovely. So I hope that helps you guys get to where you need to be in terms of trim. Uh, we got one more step for today. And that's to inject. Look at that, hmm, I love it. All right, so we're gonna work on the injection, which is commandment number six, inject your brisket. I'm not saying you need to inject your brisket, I'm not saying you don't have to inject your brisket. I'm just showing you that I'm going to inject this brisket 
Uh, as you're learning, I definitely recommend that you try one with, one without. Try different types of injections, try more injection, try less injection, try injecting with the grain, against the grain, all those different kinds of things and learn your preferences and what's easiest to work with. Today's injection is half the portion requested in the Butcher Barbecue original brisket recipe. This is phenomenal. This wins competitions all over the place. And the other half, so instead of going a third cup and a third cup of the Cosmos and the Butcher, I go one and one third, uh, sorry, I split it in half. It calls for three scoops. I go one and a half scoops of each uh, into two cups of cold water, into a gravy separator, and I shake it all about. It's gotta be cold. And I've got my pistol grip injector, in my opinion, the best on the market. Super, super fun and easy to use and it controls the portion of my injection. Um, so there's a, basically a dial here that spins and you can control how many fluid ounces are injected into your meat. And we're gonna set this baby at, at four. So just to give you an idea how this is rocking now, uh, we draw out the solution and as we pull in it's got a, a stopper here that will only release a certain amount of injection at one at one shot versus a syringe where it's a long pull and then you're basically eyeballing it or using it to feel hey there's my injector huh injector looks awesome I need to pick one up for those they're incredible um, this is actually my second one and I didn't get the second one because the first one was no more good I just saw it at the store and I was like oh my god I gotta have another one because I'm a barbecue nerd and they're awesome if you were making Montreal smoked meat with that, what would you trim before your cure? Um, it's a good question. Uh, for the sake of keeping on task, I don't want to go into that too, too much. Um, that being said, I would be of a similar belief that using and trimming what I've trimmed already would be ma a manageable portion to recreate things like burgers, sausages, uh, and then uh, pasta sauces and shepherd's pies and all these types of leftovers. So I would probably trim it very similarly. Uh, and then obviously we, the curing a brisket is a totally separate game. Right now we're talking about barbecue low and slow uh, to get that, you know, in my opinion, what is uh, the best barbecue meat there is. And that's a, a Texas style brisket. So um, now that we've got our injection ready. So again, half and half into two cups of cold water. And we take a full draw. And so right there, my draw was a little bit tight. Just on the end here, there's a little, a little uh, um, thing that you turn, a little turny. And when you turn it, it'll loosen the, the bushing that's inside the syringe channel and allow it to uh, inject a little bit easier. So on the, on the top side, I'm going to inject with the grain. Um, at first, if I was doing competition, I would inject both, uh, but for at home, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go with the grain and the concept of injecting across the grain is that as you penetrate through the grain and you inject and you release, you're going to get more than one avenue of the protein. Uh, and in my case, so I'm just going to create pockets in here like that. And you guys will s literally see the brisket kind of inflate as you're injecting. Two things you want to consider. One, uh, where I've cut off or anywhere that there's uh, the top is exposed, it's very possible that it can spray out at you, kind of like Kill Bill. So don't be afraid to put your hand over top of it just to keep it from squirting out all over your brand new Barbecue Experts apron that has a bottle opener on the side. So I'm working that way. Now I'm going to come back this way and I basically want to create like a checkerboard pattern every square inch and I'm creating a pocket. So notice I'm going in and creating a pocket before I inject. In, create a pocket before I inject. Reload. In. This, uh, Gordon Ramsay, on. In, on, on, in and on, in, on. So every square inch, and we're getting a, 
some injection happening inside of there. I'm just realizing I got to take you guys through the, the rubbing portion too here. So this is, this is not it. I just lost my syringe. Wasn't joking. Number two. Excuse me for a second while I repair. Here we go, all fixed up. Ready to roar. Same same process. Draw. Just gotta tighten the bushing a tad. We're having a rough go here. So let's assume that the uh, the injection is complete. I want to I want to rub my presentation side. Last, last shot with near the decal in case it's in the meat. I think it's in my, I think it's in here. Bam, it was in there. All right, so we've got this, we've got this brisket well injected. We could repeat the process on the back side, and I want to inject, uh, sorry, I want to rub my presentation side last. So I'm gonna turn this baby over and, and, and get this side injected. If it was injected, it would probably have a little bit more liquid coming out on the top, which I use as the binder. And we're gonna rock two different types of rubs from the House of Barbecue Experts. Uh, we've got the Explorer, which is great with beef. And we're just gonna lay a light coat, very, very light on this, just to add some depth to the flavor. And when you're rubbing the meat, you definitely want to keep a good six, eight, maybe even 12 inches up off the brisket uh, so that you're not getting big blotches of, of rub all in one spot. Yeah, right, it's an hour. Whoop. And then we're gonna go with the uh, Texas rub. The Texas rub from House of Barbecue Experts. I'm a huge salt pepper fan, huge salt pepper garlic fan. This is where it's at. It's got a little bit of onion. And this stuff, we're gonna lay it on a little heavier, kind of throw it on like a typewriter. And try to be cautious with how you apply the rub, mainly because uh, obviously you don't wanna compromise the flavor and have, have some huge spot, uh, spots of, of all salt and pepper. And more importantly, salt and pepper are extremely expensive. So that's kind of what we're looking for there on the one side. And then we're just gonna do a little bit of salt and pepper uh, additional salt and pepper. We got a 16 grain pepper and a kosher salt just to finish off the top. I like the coarseness uh, working with 16 grain pepper. Locally you can get it. It's also called butcher blend. It's just This is just a pre-mixed salt and pepper that I, that I, I made up. Uh, lightly pat it down. You could let that set if for the sake of speeding the video up. You could let this set but we're going to flip it over and finish the other side so uh, that you guys can be on your way. Again, still looks like a race car, nice and glistening. We're, we know it's gonna hold that rub. So we're gonna throw a quick light coat of the Explorer. Then we're gonna go with the Texas, House of Barbecue Experts Texas. And finish it off with 16 grain or butcher blend pepper and kosher salt. Just gives it a little bit of top, uh, top texture and helps really grab that smoke when the smoke's rolling over the, uh, the brisket. So that's it for today, guys. Look at that. She pretty. 
So I appreciate you guys tuning in. That's uh, This brisket's basically ready to go on the grill. Tomorrow we're going to talk about getting through that, that timeline that we talked about at the starting. Uh, so basically from when it goes on the grill to the wrap, we're going to talk about how to wrap and why to wrap. And then we're going to talk about getting it to the finishing temperature and textures. And on Thursday, we're going to slice it up and uh, show you guys some delicious brisket. So thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, whoever won the Texas, whoever won the Texas rub, you'll be contacted directly. Looks good. Can't wait to see the finished product. Thanks, Sean and Marcel. I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, I can't wait to, to uh, see the final product e uh, either. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be fun, especially because you're under pressure here, right? So, like, it's one thing you do one of these and you screw it up, and then you just grind it and throw it into some shepherd's pie. But this is going to be uh, it's got to be well it's got to be well done here so that people uh, believe in the product. Thanks for the great info, Stacy. Thanks for tuning in, Rob. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you guys very much. Uh, House of Barbecue experts, please like, share, follow. Barbecue with Drew, like, share, follow. Thank you guys very much. Peace out.